Welcome back to Talk Jamaica. We're streaming live on TalkJamaicaRadio.com and we're also broadcasting on Caribbean Rhythms Radio in the United States. I am Sanjay Lewis. Uh, Ralston Chamberlain is off this week and my co-host is Ricardo Brooks. For the first time, Parliament, both the estimates of expenditure and revenue measures were tabled at the same time. Well, before the beginning of the 2015-2016 financial year in April, in the same breath, Jamaica is on track to pass seven IMF tests up to December, with similar efforts being made to pass the eighth test due at the end of March. Based on the actual reading of the budget, the key economic parameters for Jamaica's next fiscal year are obvious. The most critical is a target for an overall primary surplus of 7.5% of gross domestic product, and the need to reach the 9% of GDP wage bill target by 2016, the latter being not just an IMF target, but now part of our fiscal responsi responsibility uh, based on legislation. Jamaica's total public debt contracted 2.4% to $17.79 billion in 2014 from $18.22 billion in 2013, driven largely by the impact of the fall in the Jamaican dollar on the value of Jamaica's domestic debt, which represented 51% of the total debt. It is obvious that the economy needs to go at a faster pace so that more revenue can be made available for capital expenditure rather than the majority of the budget going towards debt servicing. However, a few questions need to be answered. Is this budget the best one the government can put forward considering its limitations? Is the government doing enough to grow the economy? And despite the IMF program, is the government underspending? Also, do we expect Dr. Phillips and the People's National Party government to keep within uh, these constraints? To give us some analysis on these matters, we're joined online by fin financial analyst, sorry, Ross Ben Hyman, and the Chief Executive Spokesperson on Finance, Favor Williams. Welcome to Talk Jamaica, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Russell, let me start with you. Is this the first time that both, it's the first time rather, that both the estimates of expenditure and the revenue measures were tabled at the same time uh, before the beginning of the 2015-16 year? Is this a major achievement for the government or is it neither here nor there? Well, it's a major achievement for the country, not the government, in that provides for a greater level of transparency and accountability as well as predictability. These things are important to the boost of investor confidence. Investor confidence is important to the mobilization of investments, and investments are important to the acceleration of economic growth. So it's not something for the government, it's something for Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I agree with, with Ralston. Um, it reduces uncertainty in the economy among investors, as you said. You don't have to guess and spell anymore. I mean, if you recall... You get the, ex the expenditures first, and then you kind of had to try to figure out what the revenues would be and what the tax package would look like, and it, you know, it created a lot of uncertainty in those um, um, in the months leading up to it, and you know, until it until we hear the figures. So it's it's a, a good thing for the country. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Williams, but, you, 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 you mentioned that you, you believe it's important, uh, but do you think that Dr. Fitz will be able to stick within these confines going into an election cycle? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I just had something, some other sounds coming, into, coming in at the same time. Sure, sure. I was asking you, given the fact that the country is about to enter into an election cycle, do you expect the government to be able to keep within these confines? Well, it, it's not that I'm, you know, expecting it. They've committed to it and they have to. Um, if not, we all know what the consequences are. Um, you know, pretty much the bottom would, would fall out of the economy if they don't. Um, you have a lot in terms of confidence writing on this IMF agreement. Uh, and so, yes, they, they have to stick with it. Um, you know, they, they, they just have to. I don't, I don't think there's any choice. What we would like to see is, in addition to the INF program, that there's a real focus on growing the economy because that's the only way you're going to get 
the, the tax revenues that are projected. You're going to get serious dent in unemployment. Um, you're going to get the kind of public services that, that we require as, as residents of this country. Um, so it's not, you know, we're saying it's not just the IMF program that this country needs. It needs a growth program on top of that to get this economy going the way it needs to go. Most of the are back in the discussion because many persons have been saying growth is important and we must have growth in the economy if we're serious, you know, about moving forward. But the bigger question is, how is it that the government can really inspire growth um, within the economy? All right. The first thing is simple. Things like the presentation of the budget at this time early, reducing what we call destabilizing speculation and boosting investor confidence is very important to growth. That's a major step because you need the confidence of the investing community in order to grow the economy. So that's one. The reduction of the debt is also important to economic growth. The bigger your debt burden, the more resources you have to transfer to servicing that debt. So it constrains your ability to provide basic social services. Basic social services are important to economic growth. Improvements in the business environment, the same thing that here, Forbes talking about, the same movements that here, the World Bank talking about. All those things are important to the acceleration of economic growth. Improving access to capital, things like the security, interest in personal property registry. All those things are important to economic growth. The insolvency bill, those things are also important to economic growth. Reducing the level of government expenditure as a proportion of the economy. That's now down to about 37%, coming from as high as 50% in the earlier part of the 2000s. Those things are important to economic growth. So what the government is doing is laying the foundation for economic growth with being fiscally prudent, with passing the IMF test to improve investor confidence, with reducing the debt in order that more resources can be available to provide basic social services, in improving the business environment, in providing greater access to capital, the insolvency bill, all those things are fundamental to economic growth. Then there are the, what we call mega projects, things like the logistics hub, the investment in business process outsourcing, the investments in energy. All those things are the government's contribution to economic growth. But one thing that we're pursuing in the current model is that the private sector is supposed to be the engine of economic growth. So the government lays the foundation and facilitates economic growth, and the private sector is the actor in economic growth. What we have been seeing is that the private sector is not as responsive as they should have been. And many people in Jamaica, it's a favorite pastime to talk about politics, politicians and political leadership. Most of the time, we tend to forget about private sector leadership. And historically, what we've seen is that the private sector has not demonstrated the leadership that is necessary to drive economic growth. When we look at some of the numbers, the Productivity Center tells us that what we call, in economic terms, capital intensity, or that's the level of machinery per man of the labor force, has been declining consistently for the last 14 years. The private sector is not investing in R&D. The private sector is not investing enough in retooling. The private sector is not investing enough in training its workers. As a result of that, they have not been able to take advantage of the foundations for economic growth laid by the government. It is not the government that is going to grow the economy. The government is going to lay the foundation to facilitate economic growth. And they have been doing a lot in that regard. What we are seeing is that the private sector is not as responsive as they should be. And we need to talk to the private sector about this thing. Look at the revenue flows. When we look at the revenue flow, of the 10 billion outstanding in tax revenues, 6.6 .6 billion represents corporate taxes. That is taxes from the private sector. When we look at the PAYE, PAYE as at the end of December was running 2 billion above budget. These are the people that are subjected to wage freezes, high levels of unemployment, rising prices, yet their tax paid was running ahead. While the private sector, which is making more profits than ever, their tax take is constantly below budget. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is that we need to focus more on the private sector. Although they are making more money, they are not investing enough in R&D, training, social development. You can't compete 
international uh, or in the domestic market, in a knowledge-based economy, if you do not invest in capital intensity and the training of your workers and R&D. It's just as simple as that. Several is laying a lot of blame at the private sector. They are slow to act, not providing leadership, um, they need to train their workers. Oh, oh, it, do you share the sentiment that the private sector now need to, you know, take the need to grow this economy? Well, you know, the private sector in any country could always do more. Um, our economy, at this point in time, I think we need to, to, to look outside of Jamaica for markets. Um, or we've seen over the over the years, certainly in you know the, the last two or three years, our our exports have not done well because of the currency um, devaluation. Um, it was expected that exports would be a bright spot um, when you devalue your currency or depreciate your currency, but that hasn't turned out to be the case. In fact, what the currency does, it increases the uncertainty that businesses have. Uh, increases their inability to plan uh, because they, they don't know what level of, of depreciation that they can expect, you know, next year or the following year. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy, and I don't know that any business person is going to rush out and make big investments when you are faced with a mountain of uncertainty in this economy. Well, some uncertainty in the Jamaican economy, and that's one of the reasons why uh, private system may be afraid to, to invest. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, if you look at a 50-year, take a 50-year look at the Jamaican economy, every time there has been accelerated growth in the Jamaican economy, it's always about foreign direct investments. It's not about local investment. Because our private sector players are basically margin gatherers. They do not believe in innovation and raising productivity levels and those things. So, we see a lot of firms, international firms, still investing despite the talk of this uncertainty. Because the same private sector leaders in the confidence survey, they tell us that they have more confidence in 2014 than they had three years ago. So we can reconcile that they have more confidence as not translating in more investments. Yet we are seeing foreign direct investments moving from 218 million in 2012 to 568 million in 2013. So what is it that the foreigners are seeing that the local investors are not seeing? And why is this historically it has been like that? From boxer to aluminum in the 1960s to tourism to garment manufacture in the 1980s to Spanish invasion in the 1990s. That's what we have been seeing. All the local investors do is belly ache and say the government must do this. Every time the government do this, they say, okay, move the goalposts. They want you to do that too. And they want you to do that too. And then they are not very responsive. Okay, but can I, can I say something to that in terms of the FDI foreign direct investment in Jamaica? You suggest that foreigners have more confidence than, than the locals, but if you look at the industries into which those investments go, those, in, those industries are, one, U.S. dollar industries, and markets are abroad, take bauxite, the market for that is abroad in U.S. dollars, take tourism, you know, the tourists come here, but that's the U.S. dollar uh, sector, and you can go down the list and name the industries. Those are the, those are the industries into which foreigners are investing because, one, they know where the market is. It's outside of Jamaica. Um, and two, it's in hard currency. So I, I don't think that's a, a good comparison to compare that Sorry, but to what, what, so what are you saying? Market. Entre part of entrepreneurship is market intelligence. We live in an environment in which Jamaica needs to earn more foreign dollars if we are going to deal with the problems in our current account and in our, the, the, the balance of payments in general. So, I mean, local investors, are you saying that local investors are only to invest in local dollars? No, not saying that. When I, when no. I started out, no, when I started out, I said we have to look... Outside of Jamaica, international hold on, hold on, hold market. Hold on, hold on, please, Simon. Hold on, please, Ruston. This, this, this market here in Jamaica is small. I mean, two, 2.7 million people. No, you can't. You have to look beyond the shores of Jamaica. We have to look to exports. And I totally agree with you uh, in terms of our balance of payment. We need to be earning more U.S. dollars. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that local 
lo- the local business people are, you know, should stay in Jamaica only. No, um, definitely look to the rest of the world for business wherever there is. Ross, Ro- Ro- a, a listener just sent uh, a comment, and he's basically asking, how is it that um, private sector must take up the mantle when, uh, when the, for example, Nestle dropped 200 people, Scotia dropping staff, etc. All of the manufacturing individuals are moving outside of Jamaica because the energy bill is just so high. So how then can they, the private sector really take up the mantle? That's from local private sector can also local private sector can also invest in energy too. That's also an opportunity. So energy costs are high. Local private sector players can also invest in the energy sector too. What we're seeing is that the energy sector investments are basically being carried out by foreigners again. So those are just excuses. You know, the fact of the matter is that when we look at what is being done on the public sector side in order to deal with the problems raised by the private sector, interest rates are low, lower than they were previously. The fiscal deficit has been eliminated. Inflation is low. Not Inflation. true, Ralston. Not true. Not true. Not true. Not true. Not true. Don't say it's been eliminated. That's not true. Last, last, year, last year we had a balanced budget. This year we are targeting a fiscal deficit of $4 billion by 0.3% of GDP. No, based on Inflation. the numbers, based on the numbers that the government put out, it's more than Right. That. Inflation for the fiscal year to date was only 4.1%. Point to point, it was 5.3%. The current account deficit is projected at 5.3%. The government spending G as a percentage of Y is now down to 37%. What is it more that the private sector want to see? Are they working for a perfect world before they invest? Real investors do not work with until there's a perfect world to invest. That is why you have people like Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, and all of those people who are real investors. What is it more that they want to see? A perfect world? Hmm. Okay, let's look at the market. You and I know. Pardon me? Go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Lenz. I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. You and I know that business people, um, well, let's just say, we've not had a history of government consistently performing. We, we go through these lurches. Um, you know, we go through periods of high inflation. We go through periods of currency devaluation. We go through periods of, you know, uh, fiscal deficit, and those are the things that cause great uncertainty in the economy. I mean, the currency is causing so much angst and so much uncertainty. It's not funny. Mm-hmm. And then you have to understand this from a business person's perspective as well. I mean, talk yeah, about, saying, talk about the I'll poor, to you, if the we poor consumers. To, yeah, if the private sector continues to stay on the sideline and say, oh, it is happening now, but we don't believe that it will happen consistently. Then we are not going to get the investments and we are not going to get the growth because it is not governments which generate economic growth. It is governments which lay the foundation and facilitate economic growth. But the private sector, the investments have to come from the private sector. So what is the private sector saying? We have been used to all of these gyrations and we are seeing some stability now. So we are going to wait and wait and wait and wait. So when is it that the investments are going to take place? I'd argue that there is not a lot of stability now. Um, the currency is a major destabilizing force on the economy. The it, is, it is reducing the quality of life. I mean, the people go into the stores, they cannot buy things, their, their, their wages or the money them, their pockets is not getting them the things that they, 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 they bought last week. It, it is a major depressant on what you can do in this economy. Right. Well, the, the challenges exist. But let me bring back the discussion because, say, well, how is it that the government, or how do you think the government is going to fund uh, this budget? Or oh, it's going to fund the 2015 2016 budget? Yes. Um, well, it tells, you know, the minister says, admits that there is a gap. Mm-hmm. Of um, ten point, I think three five billion dollars that will need to be made up for the 2015-2016 year, and that uh, he will tell us what the new tax measures are in the March, you know, budget debate. So there is more taxes on the way to the tune of ten point three five billion dollars for this for this 
2015-2016 budget year that we're in. That's what we can look forward to. Um, I also think when I look at the budget, uh, that it's quite unrealistic when you look at the tax revenues that are projected to happen. So that's for the upcoming fiscal year. And look at the growth rate in the tax revenues relative to the fiscal year we're in. It, it, you're talking about a 9%. The year we're in right now is growing at maybe 6 6.5%. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where this optimism comes from that you're going to expect to see a kind of growth rate some 40% faster than this year. Um, so, you know, when I look at the budget, those are some of my takeaways. Right. And, um, you know, I don't know what the new tax measures are that they're coming with, but there will be new tax measures. Well, some people are saying that it's, it's not a realistic budget. Uh, what are your views on that? Well, you know, my views are contrary to that. I believe that the the administration and the minister have done the best that they can do. I believe that tax revenues, revenue and grants of $458 billion, that's 26.1% of GDP. Would normally, if you go back 5, 10 years, what you'd see is that tax revenues, revenue and grants normally come in at 26, 27% of GDP. The minister is spending 27.1% of GDP and he expects to call it 26.8% of GDP. I believe it is fundable, and I believe that with the aggressive compliance efforts, because we know that there are people out there who are not paying their fair share, and a lot of the self-employed people and a lot of the corporate people, and I endorse the activities that are going to be carried out by tax administration in order to improve the level of compliance. And some of the specific measures that will be employed in terms of the 10.35 billion will not have a negative impact on the mass of the people, it will be targeted at those who can pay and should pay more. But it is a case, though, Ralston, that the government continues to be optimistic because every year we hear about, you know, boosting tax compliance and people need to be compliant, etc. right? And the government is going to go after the tax dodgers. And then you, you, at the, by the end of the year, you realize that, look, we have to review our targets because we're just not going to get the, the, the level of compliance well, well, we want. Remember, forecast is not an exact science. So if you look right. at, if you look at the, 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 the fiscal policy paper and look at some of the new initiatives will be, which will be carried out by tax administration, I believe that they'll come closer this time. They are getting better and better at it, and I believe that they'll come closer at this time. All right, I'll try to, what so we could say, all right. $10 billion running behind is getting better and better? Sorry? $10 billion running behind your tax revenue. Well, are you talking about this? Yeah, well, I used to have previous dispensation were coming twice as much as that 20 billion behind, 25 billion behind. Well, I used to have dispensation just three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. So we have those numbers and we know that. So well, that, 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 was that, midst, that was the midst of a global recession. Well, when the bauxite yeah. industry fell out from we go back time, to even right? to, No, but, if you go, but I mean, if you even go back to 2011, 2010, they are used to coming in twice as far as that. So... I'm saying that they are getting better of it, and I believe that the measures to be applied now will have an effect. What we are saying, the bulk of the addition to the budget is about debt service charges. Why we say that we should not pay the debt? And no, 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 all right, I'm glad you went there. I'm glad you went there, Alston. If okay. you look at the debt service charges, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at 2013-2014, the charges were, call it $110 billion, right? Right. This was coming on the heels of the um, debt exchange, and right. and interest rates went down um, about some $10 billion, right? Right. Because mm -hmm. of the debt exchange. Um, you know, take a look at this, this fiscal year we're in. The expectation is that interest expense is going to be $129 billion. Why? Why? Mm -hmm. If there is so much stability and confidence and the debt is, you know, is, is going down and debt is being paid down, why is the interest rate up, interest expense up so much? One, we know mm -hmm. that the debt is not being paid down because the mountain of debt is increasing. Two, we know that there has been a negative impact on the mountain of debt from the currency because, you know, almost 
about half of it is denominated in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. So the currency has had a major impact on the budget. Yes, certainly. Certainly. And it's certainly like, like, that's okay, but that's not okay. That's $10 no, 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 dollars that we could have no, spent. No, no, so, what do, no, no. So, what do, so what do we do with the currency? What about it like Mr. Shaw did? That's what I said. Okay. What we no, do? No, no, no. You see, you see, the you see, we believe in a stable currency. We believe yeah, we, in growing the economy so that... We believe in growing the economy so that you can have additional, you know, foreign exchange coming into the country. Um, we believe in a stable currency and we'll do everything to keep the currency stable because that's when you get people investing, locals investing, when you get increased confidence and you don't have this sort of impact on the budget. Well, that, but we never saw that. What we saw was between 12 and 14 consecutive quarters of economic decline and an overvalued currency and a significant damaging of the country's relationship with the international no, community. Ross, 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 Dan, you're so, collapsing. I mean, you're that, collapsing that, the time. You knew yeah, the that point. in the last... You knew that when the Jamaican Labour Party handed over this government, the economy was growing. Some yeah, but we were coming from... We were coming it from, was growing. We and were you coming have, from... We yes, are coming take, a from look, take a look well, at the global world. We are coming from 10 consecutive quarters of, oh. of economic decline. Our relationship with the multilateral agencies was significantly damaged. We had an overvalued currency. No, 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 no. no. So, Rostan, tell which me, does. where is this currency going now then, since it's been, it's been so significantly overvalued? Since, the, since you have this government, it's been devalued. Where is it going to go? Where, 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 where is it going to go? All right, let me hear us some response now. Yes, we're supposed to Significant adjustments have been made. What we have seen is that the, when we look at those numbers, we have seen the currency trading somewhere between 150 and 160. The current account deficit, because of low energy prices, is now projected at 2.3%. We expect to see some stability taking place at this particular point in time, given what is happening in our current account, given the low levels of inflation, given the fiscal consolidation because of the prudent macroeconomic policies being pursued. What we need is the investing coming to step up to the plate and start the investing because without exporting, if we continue importing to manufacture without trying to use indigenous raw materials to benefit from the devaluation because that's one thing the depreciation of the currency is saying to the business community. You need to adjust your ways. You need to innovate more. You need to invest more in R and D. You need to invest more in indigenous raw materials in order to benefit. But we're not changing our ways. So what we do is say, oh, more the devaluation is affecting us because but we are doing nothing to benefit right. from it because we want to remain the same way, we do not want to transform the economy. What the currency is saying to you is that you need to address the imbalances in your balance of payments. You need to earn more foreign exchange and spend less foreign exchange. And we are trying to do that. I get in the last thing now, but I want to throw in one last question. Uh, then then Favor, with negotiations, it's, it's on the table, but we're hearing hints of another wage freeze. Um, is it a case that the government must continue with the wage freeze in order to maintain its MS deal? Or is it a case that we need to balance it and give something to the public sector workers and at the same time try to maintain the MS deal? Well, the latter. We want to have the best of both worlds. You can't look at the public sector workers after five years and say, you can't get an increase. And certainly, the public sector can't come to the administration and say, oh, we want to get back all we lost in the last five years. So we want some 10%, some 15% some 20% increase. That is not in the cards. There will be nothing more than about 5% is so much. So we need the public sector workers to get that in their heads. We cannot afford any more than that. Look, I, did, I, didn't, I, I didn't see anything in the budget. Um, you know, I'm still looking through, but I didn't really see anything. Uh, obviously, I agree with Ralph Stan. After, you know, so many years, we can't, in, you know, the government, and government can't in good conscience say there's nothing here. Um, there has to be some provision for that. But at the same time, you know, uh, they have to balance, they have to balance the, the needs there, the commitments that they made. But I'm still looking through the budget. I don't see anything in there. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, there's gentlemen. one sixty five million and there's a contingency and that is not going to allow more than a maximum of five percent. So we want the public sector workers to get that in their heads. We are not going to get back five years in one year. That's not prudent. All right, financial analyst Ralph Van Hyman, JLP Deputy Spokesperson on Finance, Favor Williams. Wonderful discussion. We have to continue this. Thank you so much for joining us here on Talk yes, to Me. Okay, Favor, enjoy that a lot. All right. This was the break. Up on a break. We're going to take the break and we come back. This is Talk to Me. Stay with us. Mm-hmm.